Such an honor to be in the house of God this morning. Anything can happen here. Anything you need to happen can happen here. Hope you all had a Merry Christmas. Hope you all got the presents that you were hoping for. If not, hope you kept the gift receipt so you could take it back and get what you wanted. Or put somebody's name on it so you can give it to them when you... Isn't it crazy the traditions that we go through? Praise God. You may be seated for a moment. I want to address, uh, do a, just a little bit of house cleaning. We... Uh, had a little bit of confusion a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was a tongues uh, a couple of Sundays ago, and it, and it appeared that we had two tongues without an interpretation. Of course, that can cause lots of confusion. People, people walked up to me afterwards and said, what happened? What's going on? <clears throat> now, the Bible says that it says, let everything be done decently and in order. And if anything happens that causes great confusion, if there's understanding, you know what I'm saying? You could, first time I walked into a Pentecostal church, everything was confusing to me. And it was like, okay, these people are crazy. But it wasn't them, it was me. It was me that didn't understand. But when understanding is there, and then something happens that causes confusion, we need to address it. One of two things happened. So there were two tongues and no interpretation. What possibly could have happened? Either God wanted to speak, but the interpreter... God chose wasn't willing. But I was feeling it. But I felt like God wanted me to give it tongues. The Bible says if there's no interpreter. Now, if there's an interpreter in the room and that interpreter is not willing, then we don't have an interpreter. So that's, that's, one, that's one possibility. And I'm not saying that's what it was. I'm just saying that's one possibility. And the other one is that we pushed it, and our timing was off. So God wanted to say something, but wasn't ready to say it yet. So if, if, if we get ahead of, if we jump ahead, and we push what we're feeling, and, and don't wait for God, then God said, I have, I have a time that I'm going to inject what I want to inject, and if you say it too soon, they're not ready to handle it. So I need to get them to this point first, and then I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to bring them to this point. If we inject it here or here, God said, no, it's got to go with my flow. So we have to find a balance between waiting too long and not waiting long enough. I opened up my commentators and Marvin Treese and breaking down the words and, and looked at it, and I thought, okay, what, what's going on here, God? I think I know what it is, but... Let me find it. But we have to find a balance between waiting too long because that can cause confusion. You get a tongues and, and it just goes on forever. Pretty soon, people are afraid to open their mouth. When the right time comes, they're like, well, now I've waited 10 minutes and now it's really awkward, so I'm not going to say anything. Well, if, if we say it too soon, people may, that, that may be the interpreter, God may not have touched them yet. He may want you to interpret and he's like, not yet, not yet. And, and the tongues comes and it's not ready. God didn't give it to you yet. So then you sit there and wait. And now the time goes by. And so it's one of those two. So we have to find the balance between waiting too long and not waiting long enough. <clears throat> the glory didn't fall in the Holy of Holies until the process was complete. There's scripture. What do you mean? The glory of God fell into that Holy of Holies when the process was complete. When everything was done according to the process, according to what God's plan was, when everybody did what they were supposed to do, boom, the glory fell. If they didn't, the glory wouldn't fall. So we have to say, God, help me plug into that process. And sometimes we can get so used to the process, we can get so used to the sequence that we sense his presence shift and we push it into happening. We have to be careful that we don't do that. We get so used to it. I mean, we even as Pentecostals can get so used to God doing things a certain way. And, 
And it's like, well, okay, I feel this. We're singing that song. Hey, God always gives a tongues interpretation after that song. We have, to, we have to be careful and say, you know what? Let's feel after God. Not feel after the sequence of the service, but feel after God and say, is this what you want to do when you want to do it? So we have to be sensitive to that. So, yet if we continue to press deeper in worship instead of allowing spiritual pressure release. I want to say that again. If we continue to press deeper, sometimes we feel that glory start to hit. And, and if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you can feel it. And you can say, oh, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. But when you feel that, that, pre- that, that, that spiritual pressure intensify, when you feel that, instead of just looking for a pressure release and saying, well, let's have tongues so that, that this pressure goes away, sometimes God says, I want you to go deeper. I want you to take what I'm doing and follow me into a deeper place than just tongues and interpretation. We get so used to tongues and interpretation. There's there's churches that say, we never have that. We just have miracles, signs, and wonders. We have have word of knowledge, word of wisdom. We have all these things. So sometimes we need to just press deeper in worship instead of allowing the spiritual pressure release. The process will take us so much deeper in the spirit. So... Before tongues is given, we must work at being disciplined enough to sense his timing. So it's not just being used in the gifts of the Spirit. It's saying, God, let me be sensitive to when. Yeah, but if I don't do it now, then somebody else will beat me to the punch. Just be sensitive. Slow down and be sensitive. If God really wants to use you, he'll he'll make everybody else be quiet. He'll say, no, I, I chose you. You be quiet. We can all feel it. But if God wants to use you, he'll say, no, you just hang on. You just hold on. I, I want to use this other person right now. So before it's given, we have to work at being disciplined. Also, sense whether there is a willing interpreter present. Well, if God just touches me, well, then I, I know he's going to take care of it. No, we have to sense. God, I feel that you want to say something, but is there somebody here that will interpret? Because if not then it's going to cause confusion. And we don't, God is not the author of confusion, right? So let's not, let's not push something if God is really not ready. Also, <clears throat> whether interpretation or prophecy, please speak loud enough for all to hear. If it's a prophecy or interpretation, and I say, God, you'd be like, what's he saying? I can't hear And if I can't hear the prophecy or the interpretation, what good is it? You know, God doesn't give an interpretation or a prophecy for the congregation for six people in the congregation, everybody that's standing around you. It's for everybody. So speak loud enough for everybody to hear. And also, please speak clear enough. Don't let the anointing emotionally overwhelm your voice to the point the congregation can't understand you. If you're so overwhelmed by the anointing and you just go, ah! everybody be like, man, they're getting touched by God, but I, what's he trying to say? I can't understand it. So slow down and speak clearly. Let God speak clearly because I want to hear what God has to say, don't you? And I know it's overwhelming, especially the first time that you get used in tongues and or interpretation it's easier to get used in tongues because then you can just speak in tongues and let it flow and and with all the emotion but when that word comes it needs to be precise and it needs to be clear so people can understand it otherwise it's causing confusion so lastly first corinthians 14 27 i found something i've been told by probably three it's Pastor Yance, Brother Hernandez, Brother Stone King. But I think there's another one. We talk about how many tongues are necessary to, to, to put together a tongue's interpretation. But it says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course. That means one at a time. And let one interpret. <coughs> Excuse me. But verse 28, something I saw, I studied uh, last week that I never saw before. If there be no interpreter... Verse 28 says, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence. Never saw that before. 
let him keep it. In other words, if there's a tongue and interpretation, if there's no interpreter, let him. It doesn't say them. It says let him keep silent. That doesn't mean man or woman. It means the person, one person. So man or woman could give the tongues, but it says if there's not an interpreter, then let him keep silent. So I've heard through those spiritual men of God, they say, you know, we only need one tongue and an interpretation if it's done correctly. Typically, when people don't do it correctly, one person speaks in tongues, and really, by the time they get done, everybody in the, in the church finally says, oh, I think we're having a tongues interpretation. And the first one is really to say, hey, everybody be quiet. But if we wait till it gets quiet and one tongue speaks, then that's all we need is one. But it says if there's no interpreter, let him be silent, not them. So we only need one tongue and an interpretation because watch, I want to give you some logic. It said, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Verse 2 says, speaking in unknown tongues is speaking unto God. So if we speak in tongues, we're speaking unto God unless it's a message to the church. But then it says, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If this means up to three tongues are allowed for each interpretation and three prophecies are allowed per gathering, then we could have up to nine tongues and three interpretations and three prophecies per service. Talk about confusing. Decently in an order seems to dictate two or three prophecies maximum per service. One of those is preaching. Only one tongues really is needed per prophecy. <laughs> we have 12 to 15 people. That would take almost all service. <laughs> so logically, we look at that and say, all right, we really only, if everybody's sensitive and we do it according to the word of God, we need one tongue and an interpretation. That constitutes one prophecy. That should happen up to three times per service. If it happens twice, if it happens three times, there's no preaching. Because I would be outside the word of God if we actually had three prophecies in one service and then I started preaching, which is prophecy, which is forth telling, then I would be out of line. So try to minimize it to two so I can still preach. Does that make sense? Not the last point, the other points. Let, let him keep silent in the church. So... Let's keep it to one tongue if we can. Obviously, if, if something happens and, you know, I don't want everybody, if, so, if a second one comes, I don't want everybody going, you know, this person's a sinner. No, I, I understand. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to put the word of God together the way it's supposed to and say, God, what do you want this to, what do you want this, and what, how can we do this so it doesn't cause confusion? I hope this helps because I spent a lot of time pulling that out, figuring that out. But I, it, in 30 years, I've never seen that before. Let him keep silent. So it refers to singular. Now, let's go to the word of God for today. Amen? I don't want you to have confusion. I don't want you to be afraid either. I, if, if God moves on you, I don't want you to say, well, if he's going to chastise me, then I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, if God asks you to do it, then we need to step out. But I've never embarrassed anybody in this church and said, all right, Jason, stand up now and, and then blast him and say, you're wrong. And I've never done that. If somebody steps out of line or needs a little bit of instruction, I take him in my office and I say, hey, good job. It was, but it was about 10 seconds too early. Next time, we'll wait about another 10 seconds and then move forward. It, it will help clarify. It will help bring uh, integrity to the gifts of the Spirit. And I say, okay, I'll try it again. Now, don't be afraid. Just... Do it with instruction. Otherwise, the Bible would say, why does the Bible say, let there be a judge? It's somebody that can help govern, somebody that can say, okay, let's do this a little better next time. That's why the Bible says that. It doesn't say to embarrass or beat them up in front of the whole congregation. So that's what I'm saying. Now, could we stand as we go to the Word of God? Hebrews chapter 11. We can thank the Lord for the Word of God. Go ahead. <clears throat> I have had people come to me and thank me for that because they say, you know, I wanted to ask that question, but I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to accuse or I didn't want to bring a shadow upon somebody else, but thank you for clarification. But yeah, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to come to me. And if I don't have the answer, I will study. If I can't find that, I will call somebody and find the answer for us. Hebrews 11.32. Nyla has a friend, Ella, with her. Ella, it's so good to have you with us today in service. <laughs> and
And no, we're not crazy. We're just, just in love with Jesus. <laughs> Hebrews 11.32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, which David did, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions like, Dan like Daniel, Quench the violence of fire like three Hebrew children. Escape the edge of the sword like many. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life. Again, Zarephath and the Samaritan. It, it, it's, it's amazing how they went through this list and it's like, okay, I can think of all these stories in the Bible where these things actually happen. And others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. I looked at better resurrection <clears throat> in the message. In the message, it says, there were those who under torture refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, colon, resurrection. It said they were under torture. They refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, resurrection. Either the writer here is saying there is something better than a life without pain, a life without sickness, a life without ridicule, a life without hunger, a life without fear, a life without loneliness, a life without rejection, a life without depression, and even a life without murder. There's something better. It's a life that includes a resurrection. That's one option. It's resurrection is better than a life without all of those bad things. Or, according to Scripture, John 5, 29, it says, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There is a resurrection either way. I can't wait for the resurrection. Are you sure? Some, one of those resurrections I can wait a long time for. But there are two resurrections. There's a resurrection of life and there is a resurrection of damnation. He is saying one resurrection is better than the other. I want to preach on the subject, wait, it gets better. Wait, it gets better. Jesus, would you touch us in these next 30 minutes? Would you let the word of God affect our life? And would you bring us to remembrance again? The precious word of God, would you help us, Lord, to be aware of what's going on in our surroundings? And would you help us, Lord, to seek the better resurrection to be ready for that resurrection, to prepare others for that resurrection. And God, we pray that you would help us to not be so focused on getting rid of things in our life that are that are like sickness and pain and, and health and poor. And God, all these other things that we, we, that we seek to eliminate, but let us seek to grab hold of the better resurrection. We pray, God, because that resurrection is far better than eliminating things of discomfort from our lives. We ask that you'd help us to give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, wait, there's something better. <clears throat> Moving on in that same portion of Scripture, it says, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Scourgings, just whipping and beating. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They put him in shackles and threw him in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, which means sawn in half. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. Uh, one, one translation said they were vagabonds being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Man, I can't wait. <laughs> wow. 
And then in verse 38, it says, of whom the world was not worthy. These people that were willing <coughs> to accept this kind of lifestyle, torture, and to be without, it said the world is just not worthy of these people. It says they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, good job, received not the promise. All of the stuff that they did, the, all of the stuff they turned their back on, all, all of the worldliness that they said, no, you can't beat it out of me. I will always, I will always give my allegiance to God. No matter what you do, you can torture me. You can torture my family. You can take away everything I own. You can beat me. You can throw me in prison. You can starve me. You can throw me in the water, in the deep. I'm not going to recuse my allegiance to Jesus Christ. And it said, these people whom the world is not worthy of receive not the promise. Verse 40, God having provided some better thing, some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wait, there's something better. We, there is a better revelation. In Hebrews 1, it tells us being made so much better than the angels, speaking of Jesus Christ, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. There is a better revelation of his name than Jehovah. There is a better revelation of his name than Adonai. There is a better revelation than the Old Testament. The revelation said, thou shalt call his name Jesus, which is Jehovah's salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. His name is not Jehovah anymore. It's Jesus. His name is Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. There is a greater, a better revelation of his name. There is a better priesthood and a better hope. For the law made nothing perfect in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did. The law gave them a hope. It gave them direction. It pointed them in the right direction. It was a bright light that exposed the faults and gave them things that they could do to correct it. But it said there is a better hope by the which we draw nigh unto God. There was an impossibility except for one man one time a year to draw nigh unto God. But he said there is a better hope coming down the road. There are better things. Wait, something better is coming where all of us can draw nigh unto God. We don't just let the pastor or the priest or Moses or the high priest draw close to God. But we, according to the better covenant and better promise, can draw nigh unto God. There's a better priesthood. Hebrews 7.21, for those priests, speaking of Old Testament, were made without an oath. But this, with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Wait. There's something better. The priesthood in the tabernacle was good, but it wasn't best. There's something better coming down the road. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered or allowed to continue by reason of death. He's saying they were. it was a good priesthood. But the problem is, is that priesthood eventually died off. The people that you'd go to and, and, and get them to minister to you, eventually they died off. And it said they, they, they were not allowed to continue because they got old and died. But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable 
priesthood. There are human priests these days. There are human ministries that they change. Over time, they compromise. Over time, their doctrine changes. But it says Jesus has an unchangeable priesthood. He's the same yesterday, today. He never changes. I want to serve somebody who never changes. He doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed one day and say, I'm in a bad mood today. I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to change my rules. And you have to play by different rules. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He lives forever. He's not somebody who dies and stops praying for us. Since he ever liveth, He's always praying for you and for me. He ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. The Old Testament priesthood, when they died, their prayers died with them. But Jesus never dies, not again. And he's praying for you and I right now. I want to serve a priest that will never die. His prayers are for us every morning, every afternoon, every night. While we're sleeping, he's praying. Forever maketh intercession for the saints. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice. He's saying those old priests, every time you made a mistake, you had to take your sacrifice and go to the tabernacle. You had to go to the temple, and you had to bring that sacrifice every day. Bring it, bring it, bring it bring it. But the Bible says, who needeth not daily as those high priests. I want a better covenant, don't you? Do you want to make a huge mistake and have to drag a huge oxen to the front of the church? And everybody in the church says, how you doing? Oh, bad week, huh? You must have had a bad week. That's a big sacrifice. Want to share it with us? What actually happened? You don't need to because you can see who they are, how wealthy they are, and what they brought. You know on a scale of how bad of a week it was. But needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people's. Notice this high priest didn't have to offer a sacrifice for his own sins and then for the other people. He didn't have to do that because he was sinless. This high priest never committed a sin. This high priest never made a mistake. This high priest never has to offer a sacrifice for his own sins. His sacrifice that he offered, it says this. It says, for this he did once when he offered up himself. He offered himself. Jesus didn't offer a sacrifice for you and me. He offered himself as a sacrifice. He didn't have to give something else for you and for me. He said, I'm going to give myself. The high priest of old gave something else. They didn't give themselves to or on our behalf. They gave something else on our behalf. But Jesus didn't give something else. The Bible says, the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus didn't give a substitution sacrifice. He came himself. I want a high priest that gives himself. Hebrews 8, 6, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Verse 5, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Can you believe how many times it says that? God is saying, wait, wait, this gets better. You ever tell someone a story and they go, oh, that's really good. No, wait, 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 it gets better. And then you tell them and then they laugh and you're like, no, no, that's not the punchline. Hang on, wait, it gets better. It gets better when you come to Jesus Christ and you repent. You feel the power of God. The blood begin to take away. You say, woohoo, and you say, wait, wait, it gets better. Get in the baptistry. Come and get it. Because the Bible says that that will take away every sin from the time you were born up until now. Wait, it gets better. 
You come up out of that tank and you feel so clean. You feel like life has begun again. And it should because the Bible says if you come to God, you have to be born again of water and of spirit. When you are born again of water, you feel like a brand new baby. But wait! I love it how he said, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, you have heard of me. Oh, wait, it gets better. <laughs> By how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. He's saying, wait, it gets better. Hebrews 9, 11, but Christ being come in high priest of good things to come. Woo! I can't wait for tomorrow. Good things to come by a greater and more perfect. Notice what he's doing. He's building one at a time. He's saying, and then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to, and oh, wait till this happens. It gets better. It gets better. The more you wait with God, the more it gets better. Good things to come. Not made. He said a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Wow, God, than the one you made in the Old Testament? Yep. Not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. There is coming a tabernacle that is not made with hands. Man can't build it. What are you talking about? It gets better. This whole Old Testament system, it was good. And it was temporary. But it gets better. Instead of having a place to go, a building to go, a tent to go to, and you have things temporarily taken care of, now you become the tent. Do you realize tabernacle means tent? It's tenting. In other words, he said there is a tenting of the Old Testament and there is a tenting of the New Testament. He said the Old Testament was a physical thing. The New Testament is something not made with hands. And he said, you're that new tabernacle. It gets better. I don't, I'm not just, I don't want to just be something you come and visit. I want to be something that you intent. I want, I want you to be something. I want you to be the tent that I dwell inside. It gets better. Wait, this gets better. Mm. Hebrews 9, 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. When Jesus was on the cross, it was not something that had to happen every day, every week, not even every year. It was a one-time thing. Hebrews 10, 34 said, For you had compassion of me in my bonds, in my shackles, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. That means... When somebody came in and they took your stuff, to be spoiled is not like a rotten egg. If I said I spoiled you, that would mean when you were looking the other way, I took all your stuff at home. See, they would spoil. They would wipe out an, an army, and then they would go in and spoil the city, meaning they would take all of their valuables, all of their cattle, all of their sheep, all of their gold, all of their silver, and make slaves out of the rest if they hadn't killed them. Make spoil. He said, when, when, when people spoiled your goods, you took it joyfully. What? Knowing in yourself that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Oh, that we could come to that point where we would say, you can't hurt me because I can't wait to get there. Doesn't matter what I have. Doesn't matter what's in the bank. They're going to, you know, wow, they keep, they keep taking it anyways, more and more, all the time. You make more and they take more. But in heaven, we have a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Your confidence in Jesus, there is a great reward coming. He didn't say it's mediocre. He didn't say it's fair. He said, it is a great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. There was something so incredible 
coming down the road. Just wait. It gets better. It gets better. Oh, are you looking for him? To him that look for him, shall he appear the second time? If we look for him, are you looking for him? Or are you just enduring? 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There is a treasure that we can have. He didn't say there is this item. He said there is a treasure. It is a valuable thing to have inside of us, and it's Jesus Christ in our hearts, the hope of glory. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country. They just almost worshipped Jerusalem. It was just so important because that's where things circled. That's, that, that was the hub. That's where they worshipped. That's where the temple was. And it said in Hebrews 11, now they desire a better country. You can get so focused on the things that God gives us, and yet all of a sudden their focus switched to a desire for a better country. That is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Are we distracted by what God has given us here? Or are we looking for a better country? Are we saying, oh, one day I'm going to hear a trumpet sound. One day I'll breathe my last breath. But my next breath, you don't stop breathing. You just stop breathing here. But your next breath will be breathing heavenly oxygen. It will be in a different place where the sun never sets, where there's no sickness and no pain. There'll be a better resurrection. One day, we'll be raised to immortality. Somebody asked me the question, well, do I have to get the Holy Ghost? I taught this on Wednesday night. And I said, well, since the Bible says, if the spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, God, if that spirit dwell in you, then the spirit that raised up Christ shall also make alive your mortal body by the spirit which is in you. So if we have a mortal, I say, well, then we have a mortal body. But if we want to be immortal, then we have to have the spirit in us. So I guess it's your decision. Do you want to stay mortal or do you want to be immortal? It's up to you. You don't have to have the Holy Ghost. (laughs) Just only if you want to be immortal. Wow, it got quiet here. I'm not correcting you today. I'm I'm not chastising. I'm just saying that's the word of God. Israel, with the tabernacle, Israel became a nation, a religion, They had a government. They had an army. They had the tabernacle, which was a visible and tangible focal point available to all to come and bring your sacrifice. There was a new day that had dawned in the lives of Israel. There was an enclosure approximately seven and a half feet that went around it. Nobody could see in. They didn't have any eight-foot tall people. So the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You just couldn't see into the glory unless you go through the door. And isn't funny, Jesus said, I am the door. You can't see into the glory until you come through Jesus Christ. Sacrifices brought to the brazen altar, animals cursed with the sins of the transgressor, the innocent still bearing the sin of the guilty. The priest then would carry the blood to the holy place, passing the showbread and the candlesticks and the altar of incense and looking to the day of atonement that one day per year that the high priest went into that holy of holies not without blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat and you you look at the ark and the mercy seat and inside them inside the ark were the contents of the ark the the law and the manna and the rod that budded and you have the the cherubims there, and God's presence dwelling there. That's the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, which is better than the tabernacle, we have the building, which 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he said the physical, we have a building of God, a house 
not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We look at John 10. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. There is one way to get into the presence of God, and it is the door of Jesus Christ. We have the sa- sacrifices that were brought to the tabernacle, and in Matthew 27, 31, it says, And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. We have the brazen altar, referring Hebrews 9, 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Animals in the Old Testament cursed with the sin of the transgressor, the person who brought the sacrifice. But in 2 Corinthians 5, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Old Testament, the priest took the blood to the sanctuary. But in the New Testament, wait, there's something better. Hebrews 9, 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He went in with his own blood. He said, you guys aren't going to have to do this anymore. I'm carrying my own blood, and I'm going to make my way past the table of showbread, the candlestick, and the altar of incense. I'm going to split that veil from head to toe, and I'm going to walk into that holy of holies and put my own blood on the mercy seat of God, and it will never be required again. Hallelujah. What a sacrifice. He said, it gets better than that. (laughs) Jesus became our sanctuary. He said, I am the bread from heaven. He said, I am the light of the world like the candlestick, and we worship him as the altar of incense was the prayers of the saints. He became our day of atonement in Psalm 103, 12. says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. He is our mercy seat. He's the embodied presence of God. It, the Bible, Bible says to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He is our mercy seat. If you need mercy, you go to Jesus Christ. He is the embodiment of God. He is the word of life in Jeremiah 31, 33 said, but this shall you be or shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. He's a miracle worker on a permanent basis. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God and you are not your own? They would have to wait until God showed up. Now you can be the temple of the Holy Ghost. You can be where God resides on a daily, hourly, and minute-by-minute basis. God can be there. You don't have to wait to come to church to call upon the power of the Holy Ghost. You can say, I need something now. And they, when they shall lay hands upon the sick, and the sick shall recover, you can be. David, and I'm closing, Psalm 17, 15 says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. David, he said, there's only one thing that I'm waiting for. Doesn't matter that I'm a successful king. Doesn't matter that God said, I'm a man after his own heart. I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, said that I may know him, that I may know him after all that Paul did, after all that he knew, after all the miracles. Paul was stoned, most likely dead. The Bible says they took him for dead. They don't stop stoning until you're dead. 
He's like, could you take that big one off of my left foot? Thank you very much. Okay, i got to go preach to someone. He got up from there and went to preach. All of the miracles that happened in Paul's life, he, the, the ship that he was on, the angels that spoke to him, God spoke through the gifts of the Spirit that Paul used. He was a mighty man of God. And here we have him in the book of Philippians, says that I may know him. I read that and I go, huh? Paul was saying, there is so much more in God. You read my resume and read the history of the things that have happened in my ministry and for the purpose of edifying the church. And I'm going to tell you, there's more. Wait, it gets better. There's more that God wants to do inside of you and for others. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable Unto his death. All the things that Paul suffered. And yet he said. I want to be made conformable. Unto his death. Nobody's swinging on the chandeliers. That's not something. I wake up in the morning and say. I can't wait to suffer. For Jesus Christ. I, I can't wait to be more conformable to his death. Anybody here see the story of his passion? You see that video? I'm sure, I'm sure it was worse than that. I'm positive. And that, I watched it four or five times. Every time I watched it, I almost wept uncontrollably. I just, I just had to stop. Put it on pause and say, give me a breather. I, did you really do this for me? And he said, I did it so that you could live. I gave my life so that you could live. I gave my potential joy in this world so that you could have joy. That your joy might be fulfilled. That you might have everlasting life. I put it on pause. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. And yet it says, Paul said, that I might be conformable unto his death. He knew the source. But he knew, he knew also that he had not yet explored the depths of Jesus' power. He knew that no matter what he experienced in Jesus, there was at least the difference between the tip of an iceberg and what's left. What you and I have experienced in him is so small compared to what is left. There's more, and it gets better. Would you stand with me? Paul said, to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I'm alive, it will be about Jesus. And if I die, you'll be doing me a favor. What a commitment. It's the last day of the year. What a, what a vision to cast for the rest of the year. To live as Christ. To die as gain. If every one of us made that a 2018 goal. I want to live for Jesus. Anything that could possibly hinder me in that endeavor, I need to move it out of the way. Because, and I think about this as I'm 25 feet up in a tree, if I slipped off of this thing today, broke my neck on the way down and when I hit would it be gain it's quite a thought every heart has an empty space where Jesus reserved only for him everything that we reach for to try to fill that emptiness it just doesn't fit it's a round peg in a square hole you know what I'm saying we, we get it, we try to, and it's hanging out, and we go, there. And it just doesn't fit. 
and we go through life, hopefully sooner than later, we find that proper peg, Jesus Christ, that fits. It just fits. We say, there, now I'm satisfied. I will be totally satisfied when I awake in his likeness. Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. <coughs> I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. If he showed up today, would you love his appearing? Or would you say, we? There's some things that I got to take care of. Could you just put the brakes on, kind of like in the middle? Give me a, at least a few seconds to repent. God, I need to get some things right. You see, if he shows up and we're not ready, we're not going to love his appearing. But if we're ready, if we have that immortal spirit of the Holy Ghost in us, we'll love his appearing. Because I promise you, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. We're going to be caught up together. The trumpet's going to sound when he comes back. And there's going to be the, the shout, hey, I'm here. And we're going to disappear in a moment and be caught up together with him in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That day is coming. Will we love his appearing? That will be a good resurrection. Jesus, incredible things happen at the turn of a calendar, at the turn of a year. Now is a good time to say, Jesus, would you help me to think with the mind of Christ? Help me to make decisions based upon my relationship with you. Help me, Lord, to always weigh in a balance things that could cause me to lean away from you or things that could cause me to lean toward you. Help me to make those decisions, Lord, that would constantly draw me close to you. Prepare me, Lord, for that soon coming day, that day of the Lord. I want to love your appearing. I want to be prepared. God, I want to have oil in my lamp. I want to be ready for the marriage supper. I want to be part of the bride. Help me, Jesus, to keep my mind on you. I want you to be in my mind, in my thoughts, in my schedule. I want it to be about Jesus. Would you like to come and pray? preparation. Would you come and talk to him this morning? Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Let's worship. Jesus. Into your arms, I'm drawing I want it to be better, Jesus. Again, Let it be better to today. Dwell with you. Hallelujah. It's my only heart's desire. It's my only heart's desire.